My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guests no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Hello again, fans of theater and my listeners. My name is Aaron Odom, and welcome to another episode of Euripides Humanities. I've got a really fantastic guest on the program today. Uh, this uh, person was a, a student of mine a long, long time ago and has made so amazing strides after that. It's like the best thing that a teacher can hope for is that your student goes out and does a lot better than you do. And she did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My friends, Thank you. this is Ashley Daniels. Hello, Ashley. Hi. <laughs> How have you I'm been? I'm so excited to be here. Yes. Oh, um, I, I am great. Um, I am currently in Wyoming, which is not where I reside, but I'm up here visiting my family. And, you know, after this last year, like, oh. who can complain? So excited right. to be here in 2021. And the yeah. calendar year flipped over, and I think just about everybody else did as well. That's awesome. <laughs> Let me catch everybody up to speed. You are here from Sheridan, Wyoming, our hometown. You went away mm -hmm. to study, and after school, you got involved in theater in Albuquerque, which took you down a lot of different roads. So tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, so I uh, I left college, and I had a uh, theater job in Denver, but I wasn't, like, super thrilled about it. And my cousin was like, hey, I think they make movies in New Mexico, so, like, come live with me. And like, maybe you can work in movies. And I was like, oh man, that sounds oh, so nice. cool. So I went with my gut and moved almost literally the next day. <laughs> um, yeah, got a job in film two days later, working as a background actor in a TV show called Manhattan, oh, which great. actually, yeah. So I actually worked on that show for an entire summer, which I learned so much so quickly. And I made so many mistakes, which was, you know, <laughs> as you learn you know that's kind of the beautiful thing about the arts is like when you get thrown into something that you totally don't know you just learn on your feet which was amazing hmm. so then I made a bunch of friends doing that ended up joining the filmmakers union IATSE and for the oh, next nice. five years I did um, electric grip and props for over 30 movies and television shows in New Mexico Wow. Yeah, because yeah. Netflix has a production hub down there, don't they? Yes. So they just uh, they just partnered with IATSE and New Mexico Film, and they bought Albuquerque Studios. So a lot of the stuff that's happening on Netflix is happening in New Mexico, which is beautiful. Right, because yeah. there's like some great tax incentives or something I read the, oh, yeah. about filming in New Mexico. It's just like, if you can handle the desert, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, if you can handle the extreme cold and the extreme heat, you're great. There you go. Perfect. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, and lots of you, dirt. <laughs> now, I know right now you're in Wyoming, but right now you're also not located in Albuquerque anymore. So what, what happened there? No. So I um, made the big decision to move to Atlanta, Georgia. Ah, uh, more movie making stuff. Yeah. Yes, because Atlanta is a bigger film hub because they do a lot of the like Marvel stuff. and Right, um, right. So I decided to move out there, but my timing was a little poor because uh. I moved 10 <laughs> days before the pandemic hit last year. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. So okay. Timing was a little off. And um, my boyfriend who uh, he is an actor, but he lives in Tampa, Florida. He, you know, once, because at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all, we didn't know what was going on and you know, how, dangerous this was going to be so since I was so new to Atlanta we decided that I should go down to Tampa and only for a month was our agreement was <laughs> oh I'll just go to Tampa for a month and here I am almost a year later still in Tampa but I will be back in Atlanta <laughs> soon so oh my god okay good 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 yeah <laughs> awesome. and definitely some cool future work heading out for you so 
going into the uh, idea of like throwing yourself into things without really knowing yeah. where they were going. Uh, I actually, I got a really interesting uh, little uh, piece of uh, theater history for you today. And <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> and just to declare, I have not told you anything about this, have I? No, we, okay. I specifically said, I want to know nothing about this when you asked me to do this. <laughs> I said, please surprise me. So okay. I'm very Excellent. excited. Well, that's what we do. We're going to go back just a little while ago, about maybe 150 years. So Ashley, what can you tell me about the social response to the Industrial Revolution? Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the Industrial Revolution was one of the, I mean, it's in the title, but was one of the most revolutionary times in our history because okay. there was so much change happening throughout the world on a global scale. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and like machinery was happening, printing, boom. like everything was just becoming a lot easier to do, but also a little bit more dangerous okay. um, mm -hmm. with the advent of machines, but... Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I got for you. Okay. <laughs> well, as we know, and as we have seen, artistic movements tend to reflect or react to what we sometimes will see in history, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll start there. The Industrial Revolution brought about quite a few changes that might not have been foreseen. While the barons of industry saw a way to mass produce commodities, the societal changes were less than expected. Frankly, the draw of metropolitan living, not to mention steady work, saw thousands of people leave their provincial homesteads and seek out a new future in urban lifestyles. This hasty binding together of people from so many different backgrounds occurred all over the Western world and developed something which has occasionally been seen in the world before, but never possibly quite to this extent. A working class. Yep. <laughs> so, and I mean, can you imagine how crazy it must have been? Like, in a historical, like, if you look at how everything was before, people were living in, like, mm -hmm. tiny towns and farming villages, and then all of these, like, cultures and people coming together right. all at once. The absolute <laughs> madness right. that must right. have ensued. I but mean, also, like, how beautiful is that? Right, right. I, I mean, I was just thinking that, like, you know, you have people from this background and you have the people from this background and you have all these stories in history where people, because of their nationality, were spurned or looked down on. And really all they needed was a strong back and a good set of hands and they could help out somehow. Here you have all these people just suddenly thrust. It's like, hey, we have a chicken factory and we just need people to pluck chickens all day. Can you do that? Okay. Doesn't matter what you, what race you are, what ethnicity, what gender, just go. Yeah. Awesome. Soon, several things became starkly apparent to this new working class. <laughs> Firstly, there was a very clear division and healthy buffer zone between the working class and the wealthy class, or rather those who did the work and those who profited from the work. Yep. Next, it became apparent that the wealthy class, aka the bourgeoisie, for those of you who have done your Marxist studies, they lived lives of extraordinary comfort, ease, and power, while the working class, most of all, uh, also known as the proletariat, they suffered low wages, poor housing, and less than ideal medical care. And atrocious working conditions. Atrocious working conditions. Atrocious. <laughs> How many of them survived is still a mystery to me. Like looking at some of those factories, I'm like, but for real though, you guys need to unionize. You're right. I lost me hand in the grinder last week. I got me another one now. It's fine. As you're like <laughs> buying your meat at the grocery store and you're like, hmm, this meat is like 90% pork and 10% human hand. How strange. Well, you know, I mean, they say so many like <laughs> spider legs and rat hairs are in candy bars. Oh my gosh. Don't remind me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <clears throat> But most of all, the proletariat started to realize that in terms of sheer numbers, they vastly outnumbered the bourgeoisie. Well, maybe all of those thoughts didn't occur at the same time in all places, but let's just say that most of the working class recognized that while they were no longer living provincial lifestyles, the urban life was not all it was cracked up to be either. Now, it would seem, based on these numbers alone, 
that the proletariat would simply overthrow the bourgeoisie in any circumstance. And of course, this did happen a few places, most notably in Russia in 1917. Mm -hmm. But in Europe and America, the proletariat seemed to take something more of a diplomatic and artistic approach to examining this problem. Now, in some cases, like you said, unions were formed, which, for better or for worse, at least raised the issues affecting the working class to a more public forum. But in art forms, and particularly theater, artists focused on the individual facets of life in order to help create a healthier society. I think it's really beautiful that, like, theater in... Theater always tends to take the side of the downtrodden. Oh, right. Which, yeah. Which is such a beautiful thing because a lot of times, especially before like modern television, those stories wouldn't get told without theater. Right. So right. It's, exactly. it's such a yeah. beautiful like thing to know that theater changed the lives for these people in bringing the message to the bourgeoisie because most of the time the people going to theater were the bourgeoisie. Were not, the bourgeoisie. <laughs> yeah, not the, the people, people who, who were poor. It didn't really affect at all. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I'm going to get into that here in just a second here. Um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm jumping ahead. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, in theater, this movement became known as the realist movement. Okay, are we brushing up on some theater history here? Yep, we're, we're <laughs> dusting off the cobwebs. <laughs> First of all, in theater, this movement became known as the realist movement, okay? Uh -huh. For the better part of the prior century, a playwriting format called the well-made play had been practiced on stage. <laughs> Which is such a pretentious name, like the right? well-made play. There will be no play better made than the well-made play. Listen, I created a recipe, <laughs> and if you do it other than that, it's garbage. <laughs> it's going to be a poorly made play. It would be poorly made. <laughs> More or less, this is basically a formula for writing a play, a fill-in-the-blank style, if you will. You have a pretty basic plot structure, some goofy foibles amongst generally upper-class people, all of which come to a head upon the introduction of a prop that was generally the title of the play, a glass of water, a scrap of paper. <laughs> And generally, the plot would begin to resolve itself upon the introduction of this prop, and the play would end relatively harmlessly. <laughs> it's almost like Mad Libs for theater. Right. <laughs> like, that's, like, that's exactly what that reminds me of. It's like, okay, insert this here. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and what you need here is name of governess. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Name of something you hold in your hand. So you can probably see where a couple of things that might be problematic for the working class here. Yeah? First of all, the plays aren't really about a class they're a part of, so they're already at a disadvantage. But more than anything, the plays wrap up nicely and don't really address any of the issues of the day. Uh, well, you see, by this time, the theories of philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche had become quite popular. And more or less, Nietzschean ideas focused on challenging traditional moral values and determining what might be truly good or evil, or if these concepts truly existed. He is quite famous for the phrases, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. And Ooh, that's a good one. And to live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in the suffering. Oh man, he's a he's a dark dude. I mean, don't tell me emo <laughs> came about in the two thousands. <laughs> yeah, he definitely like if we look back in history, he had like in, like the heavy eyeliner, yep. probably from like working in a coal factory or something. Yep, the checkerboard belt. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, a new method of theater almost became necessary to explore and challenge the traditional values that had more or less been instilled in the working class. And it's at this time, at the end of the 19th century, that we get plays like Ibsen's A Doll's House and Strindberg's Miss Julie. And while A Doll's House is more or less the staple work of the realist movement, and Miss Julie came from what could be argued as a more concentrated form of realism known as naturalism, each play challenged the traditional values of the roles of the man and woman in a marriage. I haven't read the other play that you mentioned, but A Doll's House will always like have a special place in my heart because it is so transformative for the woman. Right. And just how powerful that play is right. without being, you know, very showy or whatever, or using a ton of props right. or like different locations. It's mm -hmm. just such a brilliant piece of work from that time era. Oh, yeah. And 
you know, spoilers for those who haven't read it, go out and read it. Um, but Please a do. woman in a, a really nice position in life leaves her husband because she realizes she's no more to him than really like an object or fulfilling just a space of what is expected of a life. So, Which is so unheard of for a woman in that time period. Like that's right. almost she, shameful. Yeah. And really she doesn't do it out of spite or anything. She just goes, I'm out. And Which I'm uh, like, yes, girl. Yes. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, I, queen. I also think like, I'm so glad uh, uh, there has been a sequel written and it went to Broadway a couple of years ago and it was really goofy and stupid, but kind of a parody of sorts. But I often think of poor Nora after she left, she would be ostracized. Like yeah. if she didn't go to a convent or something, eh, Nora's dead. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, in that time, like a divorced woman was unheard of. Oh or, my god! I mean, mm -hmm. it was like that was that was social suicide. Oh yeah, and absolutely, you couldn't hold a job, you couldn't own property. Like it was yep. almost a death wish. Yep, you got it. Now, just like John Patrick Shanley said in the preface to his play Doubt in 2004, doubt makes the world go round. Basically suggesting that if things don't get challenged every now and then, society will stagnate and there will be no evolution. Thus, if traditional values weren't challenged post-industrial revolution, how could the working class stand to live their own lives? Hmm. Ah, what brilliant words. Such Boom. brilliant words. Boom. Uh, just came out of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so... Here's where kind of my theme for the episode is going to be going and then start coming out. And I hope you can see it coming. I kind of build these things up and then tear them down a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the realists called for precisely what their title suggests, realism. Their scenic design basically called for sets that looked like everyday life rather than painted backdrops or suggestions. And this actually brought about a huge revolution in the world of design. And that's primarily your background, right? In, yes. in education, right? So you might be able to fill me in on <laughs> some of these things, but I'm, I'm wondering if you've heard of some of this as well. This is where the box set came from. Now, for those of you who don't know what mm -hmm. the box set is, it's basically like, what if you could remove a section of reality, like the room I'm sitting in right now, put it in a box, place it on a stage, and then remove one side of the, the box so the audience could see the action. That's pretty much a box set. And this is the way that realists approach design. And it's a type of design which we often see on stage uh, in today's theater. Three walls of a room, and the fourth wall is removed so the audience can see the action. The box set was basically built to real specifications as though building an actual location. Am I right so far? Yep, you're spot cool. on. All right. Now, this did become something of a problem when a play had multiple locations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> While some designers figured out how to use flats or drops to represent multiple locations, others demanded a little bit more finesse. This is when some truly impressive but possibly overzealous stage construction became required. And some cue designers... the scene change. Yes, here we go. <laughs> some designers made things easy by having several locations built on different places on a rotating disc. Yep. So when the scene needed to change from one place to another, the set could simply rotate and the play would be somewhere else. Which I always think about those. I have fortunately never been on one of those stages. Like I watched <laughs> Hamilton yeah. on Disney Plus and thinking mm -hmm. about being on a rotating stage, I would fall flat on my face. <laughs> like even if I wasn't supposed to be on stage, if I was working as like crew or whatever, or even if I was an actor trying to exit and the stage started rotating, I would be a mess. Hot mess. I saw it in Salt Lake <laughs> three or four years ago now when it was on tour. And I was thinking oh, yeah. the exact same thing. Like I looked down there and I'm like, ooh, cool. Yeah, the discs. I get to see the discs and how they work. And I'm just like, how in the hell do you not have Velcro on your shoes to the floor? How are you doing that? That's a, it's to a, the a, sky, to the air. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your airbenders. Um. <laughs> now, for some designers, this was not enough. Some theaters were actually built to include what can only be described as room elevators. Have you seen these? No, I have not. Oh I've my heard God. of them, but I have never okay. seen one. This is where 
one scene could basically be lifted through the ceiling and another raised from the floor to replace it. Then if more scenes are needed, the scene that was just lifted to the ceiling, there's anterooms to the left and right. So they can like move stuff off and move new stuff in and basically have a new set right there in place. And so it's like you have two levels that can go up and down all the time and a crew of people just like hurriedly changing an entire thing. And remember, it's realism, so it has to look right. That's I want to know how many cups of coffee that stage manager had. <laughs> That's that, what I want to know. <laughs> maybe just whips across the back. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. How did they get all of those people to coordinate? Yeah. And especially because headsets were not a thing at the time. I <laughs> cannot imagine the <laughs> insanity. And you can't ruin the illusion by yelling across the stage. So, you know, what did they do it with semaphore with like flags or something? But yeah. <laughs> I kind of think of it like set design Tetris. Yes. <laughs> Just moving and moving. <laughs> okay. Now, even further, the naturalists are often credited with requiring that a play resemble a slice of life. So if realism took it far, naturalism took it way far. They're like, okay, punk rock, you don't even have a choice. We're going metal. In the preface for his play, Miss Julie, playwright August Strindberg demanded that everything be virtually realistic, and I mean everything. He demanded that the back wall actually be diagonal to the stage so, so that it would appear somewhat more natural rather than staged. So speaking of appearing natural, here's what he had to say about performance in the same preface. I can't do this in like any other voice. Of course, I have no illusions about getting the actors to play for the public and not at it, although such a change would be highly desirable. I dare not even dream of beholding the actors back through an important scene, but I wish with all my heart that crucial scenes might not be played in the center of the proscenium. Instead, I should like to have them laid in the place indicated in the situation. Thus, I have to ask for no revolutions, but only a few minor modifications. To make a real room of the stage with the fourth wall missing and a part of the furniture placed back toward the audience would probably produce a disturbing effect at present. He goes on, in wishing to speak of facial makeup, I have no hope that the ladies will listen to me as they would rather look beautiful than lifelike. <laughs> Burn. Oh. Um, <laughs> but the actor might consider whether it be to his advantage to paint his face so that it shows some abstract type uh, which covers it like a mask. Suppose that a man puts a markedly choleric line between the eyes and imagine further that some remark demands a smile of his face fixed in a state of continuous wrath. What a horrible grimace would be the result. And how can the wrathful old man produce a frown on his false forehead, which is smooth as a billiard ball? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he didn't have like specific people in mind for this, then oh, yeah. I don't know what he's talking about. No, now, he definitely course... had people in his mind. Like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm looking at you. Margaret and Ted at you. <laughs> Of course, I can see where he's coming from. And for today's audience, this doesn't seem like much of a change. You know, I mean, you know, in acting, we're frequently taught to cheat out to the audience and make sure that they can see our chest in a proscenium setting. But, you know, there are times when it's really stupid to have somebody pointing out like that. So just yeah. imagine a time in which this is revolutionary. <laughs> and he didn't stop there. His stage directions state that the entirety of the play is to take place in a kitchen, and as the diagonal wall suggests, the corner of a kitchen. And he demands Ooh. that the shelves, oh, right? And he demands that the shelves are stacked with pots and pans of, quote, copper, iron, and pewter, and specifically notes the design on the lining on the shelves, as wow. though the audience could actually see that. Yeah, he got <laughs> real detailed. <laughs> right? <laughs> And me, like, having design sets before, mm -hmm. that to me, I'm like, bruh, absolutely not. Those shelves so, are getting built with whatever we have in the back. We're tearing down some <laughs> other set to make these shelves. You are getting what you're getting. But no, the crowd molding. <laughs> Now, this is also the time of the creation of the realist method of acting, famously brought to life by Stanislavski. But that 
in itself would probably yield enough interesting content for another episode. So I'm not even going to talk about it here. And by the way, do all acting pioneers go back and try to cancel or erase their prior works? I mean, it yes. seems like, yeah, Stanislavski kind of did. He's like, this is the way to do it. And wrote a book and formed a school on it. And then they got there and he went, I was full of shit. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Read this We're one. We're going to do it this way. <laughs> I think it's really because like they sold their book and then they were like, hmm, I need to make more money. How do I make more ah, money? Right, the old book yeah. is out. The new book is in. Man, that seems to be a uh, recurring theme on this podcast. <laughs> we kind of alluded to that in episode two with uh, yeah. another, yeah. I suppose it would be helpful to mention that the works of Sigmund Freud were on the forefront of people's minds as well at this time. <laughs> that I, guy. Never, I never know what reaction I'm going to get when I bring that name up. <laughs> he's, so, he's an interesting fellow, that Sigmund that's, Freud. Uh, his theories on sexuality, but moreover, individual human drives and desires started to make people think that there might just be a little bit more to the human existence than what can be observed with the eyes. So these realist and naturalist movements, while a wonderful shift away from the aesthetic of the well-made play, still didn't really strike at the heart of what people were going through. Hmm. So frankly, there was so much more going on for the working class on psychological and emotional levels than could be explained by these hyper-realistic endeavors. Plus, the realist and naturalist movements, while painstaking in their efforts to present a theater that closely resembled real life, could not produce dialogue that felt genuine. I mean, pretty much, they ended up being overtly verbose and not entirely reactionary, and most natural dialogue in reality tends to be <laughs> the opposite. So, therefore, something different needed to happen. And what was that? Hmm, here we go. <laughs> now, a lot of these realist and naturalist playwrights eventually moved to a new type of playwriting known as symbolism. As opposed to realism and naturalism, where playwrights believed they could elicit emotional response and thus societal change through observation of, quote, real life. The opposite of this would be anti-realism, and in this case, symbolism. Something on the stage could represent a feeling or a circumstance without actually having to be real. Hmm. Ah, and we love when we get into this part of theater. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just wait. This goes in some directions. I don't know. <laughs> every I time love I to overanalyze everything, so this is right up my alley. Good. I can't wait. Here we go. Now, the symbol is furthermore imagined a theater where the real would be replaced by the exposure of what might be going on in the hearts and minds of the characters and manifesting those on stage. A foundational axiom of the symbolist movement came from the poet and arts critic Stéphane Mallarmé. Depict mm. not the object, but the effect which it produces. That is clever. Mm-hmm, right? So these plays didn't really focus on action, here meaning plot, as much as they did atmosphere, as the focus of symbolist drama was to extract some of the feelings from dreams and fantasies. Sometimes there would be virtually no plot at all, but rather a series of unnerving experiences. For example, one of the figureheads of symbolist theater was Belgian playwright Maurice Metterlink. One of his best known plays is the 1890 play, The Intruder. Do you know this one? I don't. Okay. You, uh, you probably won't after I give you the description. <laughs> <laughs> Not much really happens through the play. <laughs> A family is waiting for a priest and a nun to come bless the birth of a child who has just been born in the home. <gasps> I do know this one. Do I? Yep. Okay. I do. Okay. Okay. Now, as they're waiting, a series of noises can be heard like bumps on the stairs. In one scene, the birds are singing and then they are deliberately cut off. The newborn in the other room starts crying and then is abruptly silenced. Sometimes the lights slowly flicker and then it is revealed that the mother died giving birth, or after giving birth. So therefore, the intruder was death, and the foreboding moments were all harbingers of death's arrival. Ah, oh, man, I <laughs> love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think symbolism is like my favorite. Oh yeah, okay. Oh yeah. Okay, well, why is that? Realism is just so 
everything is straightforward. Everything is just, you know, laid out right. for you. Right. Whereas symbolism is just, you can find so many different meanings in things. And like mm-hmm. how you said earlier, assigning value to something that maybe isn't like alive or real right. and just the whole something can be something totally different. So this stranger, instead of it just being like someone knocking at the door, it's mm-hmm. death coming to visit or <gasps> whatever. I love it. You mean we can be visited by a concept? Yes. Oh, I things mean, don't have to be just things. <laughs> just like I can't grab it and touch it and feel it. There's intangible stuff. All right. Yes. Interesting. Now, I mean, while on some surfaces that can be a little difficult to dig through, it's a new art form. In fact, there are quite a few movements that directly counteracted realism that we now classify as anti-realism. And while most historians will suggest that symbolism could be something of a gateway art form to discuss anti-realism, I would suggest that we also need to look at some of the other movements that paralleled and followed the advance of symbolism. Oh, God, I love this. Now, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stop here for just a moment. As I said okay. the word advance, for these movements were known by another name. You took French, didn't you? I did. Okay, and what does these, do these other movements also, what are they known as? I don't remember. <laughs> the avant-garde. Ah, yes! Uh, Translated from French, the term means advanced guard or a faction of troops that goes ahead of the rest of the military body in a conflict. (laughs) Maybe a little uh, puffing yourself up there. Um, The term was first used near the beginning of the realist movement in the visual arts world and then found its way over to performing arts soon afterwards. More than anything, the avant-garde movement is associated with breaking from tradition and experimenting with predefined artistic forms to see if reinventing the wheel would result in a more effective performance outcome. And, I mean, we have to say that it did. Yeah. We do. We love breaking the norm. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Although at this time... (laughs) Maybe not. It's always like the first attempts that seem to go... Good try, sport. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I mean, it's like when you're when you're like learning how to walk, you got to go through like stumbling and falling a couple times, and then you like really figure it out, but you still stumble and fall a couple yep. times, and then you're like running, and you're like, oh, I now got I got it. it, now I got it, and then they give yeah. you a bike, <laughs> and then it's a whole, and then it's a oh. whole another movement, yep. and you're like, well, it was fun back there, nice to see you. Now this avant-garde movement also became known as experimental theater, which somewhat implies the use of the scientific method. And spoiler alert, I would imagine these movements are grouped together as experimental theater, mainly because most of these new styles of theater were tried and didn't entirely succeed. So, oh boy, I hope you've heard of this play. If not, this is fun. So after the symbolist movement, a French playwright by the name of Alfred Jarry, have you heard of Jarry? Mm. Oh boy! I <laughs> might have, but it's been so long. Oh, here we go. Jury grew to some fame or notoriety, depending on who is asked. Jury, growing up, had a reputation for being something of a smart pupil, but also for being something of a troublemaker. In fact, while scoring perfect marks, Jury's teen mischief took aim at his physics teacher, an obese man who was rattled easily and often, who Jarry and his mischievous peers took to task on a daily basis. <laughs> that poor man. That poor Just man. getting bullied by kids. <laughs> All day. He had quite the reputation for being just oddly shaped. Oh. <laughs> he was really overweight and had short little legs. <laughs> oh, and they were picking on him. That's so mean. <laughs> and since he would be challenged by his pupils daily, he would often be quite nervous in front of class, drop things, and become quite flustered when being asked a barrage of questions designed to make him quite flustered. <laughs> oh, I feel so bad for that poor man. <laughs> oh, oh, God, just wait. <laughs> Can in you fact, just imagine how sad he went to his wife every night, like going home and being like, the kids were picking on me again. Ah, here, have another cream pie, but I don't want you. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it became a regular occurrence that while the teacher was turned to the chalkboard, the students would even hurl frogs and grasshoppers <gasps> at the chalkboard to rattle him even further. <laughs> 
nope, nope. <laughs> that's when that slapping stick that teachers used to have, that's when that needs to come out. <laughs> I hate to say that, but... Ma'am! <laughs> Just... Oh. Now, Jari and his friends developed an illustrated set of epic plays using all their creative power to ridicule the teacher on, in print at all opportunities. And, what did he do? I mean, frankly, Jari was no prize himself. Main adult size. He was like five foot three. And in class, it was noted that he would get this horrific little grimace when he would cough. And mm -hmm. it would happen often just because he was kind of a sickly kid. But his uh, character that they created was named Pere Heb, short uh, for the teacher's surname, Heber. And it was always drawn as having a large belly and oddly twisting arms and was generally a character that anyone could mock. This character would eventually morph into the protagonist Pere Ubu or Papa Ubu. Do you know where it's I'm going? Not, I don't oh, know where God. you're going. Okay. And I'm, I'm so excited and also scared at the same time. <laughs> Jari's artistic notions followed most of the simplest playwrights in that he meant to defy convention and create a type of theater that would not necessarily mock the established order, just show something that he thought would more accurately depict the stark division between working and wealthy mm. classes. Yeah, it's totally. Because <laughs> yeah, he's, I mean, he's been like a good kid so far, of course. Of the course. result was Ubu Wa, or Ubu the King. Now seen as a parody of plays like Hamlet and Julius Caesar, the plot involves a wealthy man in Poland named Ubu who develops to a plot to assassinate the king and assume the throne. At the time it was written, Poland was not yet established as a country, so Jari made sure to note that the play takes place in Poland, basically nowhere. Hmm. What a cool guy. But it was the opening night in 1896 that really enhanced the notoriety of Ubu Wa. On that night, Jari, with his face painted white, stark white, addressed the crowd for 10 minutes before the play. In his address, he claimed his work to be as good as Shakespeare's and proceeded oh. to thank the many individuals he credited with making this production possible, including several critics who were in the house at the time. Gotta thank your haters, too. <laughs> Suck up to the right people. Please yeah, give right. us a good review. <gasps> Jari announced that there would be no orchestra as he didn't think those sounds could accurately accompany the work he had created. And again, he enforced that the work they were about to see could rival anything that Shakespeare had written or could have ever written. Man, he just had big old britches, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> the swagger. And like I know. I said, it was a 10 minute address. Like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of times you have that, like, the director comes out at the beginning. Hey, thanks for coming to the show tonight. We really appreciate it. Our next show is blah, blah, blah. And enjoy the show. Yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> and even me sitting in my seat, I'm like, come on. Yeah, uh. I'm getting going already. Where's the interlude? <laughs> come on. 10 minutes. This guy in white face paint is up there telling you how great his play is. <laughs> And then he goes, and you know and then, that like somebody's elbowing, like some wife is elbowing her husband, and she's like, "Can we get out of here already?" Yeah. Like, <laughs> you wanted to we're go. We're ten to minutes this. in. You put money into this, <laughs> my God. Um, <laughs> after his address ended, Jury retired to the wings, and the curtain rose. What the audience saw, as far as the set was concerned, could really only be described as infantile drawings of all seasons and biomes on the stage at the same time. All right. On stage upon curtain open is Papa Ubu. He is dressed in a pear-shaped white canvas sack that allows his arms and legs to come out, but otherwise is filled to the point of bulging to imply obesity. Oh my gosh. <laughs> His face is painted in stark white with black shapes to imitate those seen in the illustrations of Pereheb from Jari's youth. Any and all other characters are either wearing masks or costumes in which the head is part of the costume. But as I said before, Papa Ubu stands there on stage and facing the audience, okay, brush off your French here, and says his first line, Merda! Shit! <laughs> Now, maybe my uh, pronunciation wasn't great because it's not actually shit. It yeah, is... Merd is bad, I believe. Yeah. Like, very bad. Yeah, yeah. But he says, Merdra. So Jari's oh. like, I didn't really say it. I put an extra R in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when adapted into English, 
My favorite <laughs> translation of this opening line is Shitsky. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, most I have a really hard time imagining the French saying Shitsky, <laughs> but it also makes me really happy. Uh, what is this line? Uh, Shitsky. Um... <laughs> Um, excuse me, how do you say uh, merde in, uh, merde. in English? <laughs> Is it the... Uh, oh, that's Shitsky. <laughs> Someone with like a really heavy like North Dakota accent. Oh, yeah, you know, that's, oh, that- that's how we say, yeah, Shitsky, you know. Yeah, you know, you ever, you ever had a cold Shitsky? No? <laughs> oh, man, ain't no fun out there in the Moose Lodge. Anyway. <laughs> now, <laughs> most reports can agree on at least one thing that the crowd immediately reacted to the opening line, and it took 15 minutes to settle people down before the play could continue. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, it just happened like this. Curtain up. Shitsky! 15 minutes. <laughs> but the reaction is what is often debated. Frankly, during those 15 minutes, at least two parties left the performance, but the floor became as divided as the U.S. Senate floor in that virtually half the crowd stayed because they thought the play was brilliant and half stayed to further their ire for the flip of convention. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Before the play could continue, the house manager had to turn on the lights in the audience to break up a fist fight that had broken <gasps> out in the empty orchestra pit. <laughs> I mean, I know that this is pure chaos, but what I wouldn't do to be a fly on the wall. I'm just eating my popcorn. (laughs) Oh, look at that guy over there. He's getting real mad about (laughs) Shitsky. Oh, God, I said it. Did he hear me say it? (laughs) The actors on stage stood in waiting as though watching a theater performance that had been designed for them. Now, once everything had settled down, the scatological references continued. It seemed that Papa and Mama Ubu loved to talk about shit, and it was actually the method employed in part of their assassination plot. (laughs) Papa Ubu offers some nobles a dirty toilet brush to eat. And they all do. And they die from the poisoning. Furthermore... (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Furthermore, once Ubu becomes king, he has the brains of many of his subjects removed... Because there is actually a character named the Disembraining Machine. Wow. <laughs> this almost feels like absurdist theater. And uh, it's yep, yep. like, I feel like this has to be like part of the foundations of absurdist theater oh, because this is just we go. bizarre. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, though satire, upon the play's end, the two factions, the lovers versus the haters, continued to riot in the streets. <gasps> and their rancor continued in print thereafter. <laughs> Ubu the police are getting called to go downtown to where that theater is. And they're like, so what happened here? And they're like, we saw a play. Huh, huh. And they're like, the, 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 the guy said, well, I won't even repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they ate a toilet brush. <laughs> <laughs> Ubu Wa was outlawed after its first performance. <gasps> But Jari went on to write two more plays featuring Ubu. <laughs> Which were probably, you know, both better than anything Shakespeare yeah, could write, yeah. you know. Well, unfortunately, he died at like 32 because uh, he just really enjoyed drinking. And that pretty much was it. Now, Jari's work was really only a precursor. The movement known as Expressionism began to take off in the late 1890s and was developed over the next 30 or 40 years. Now, this is where I'm going to take a little bit of departure away from kind of the weird and go into something kind of cool. And then we'll go right back to the weird. (laughs) The main characteristics of Expressionism are very similar to symbolism, but has some very specific characteristics of its own. The Expressionists saw the world as fairly cruel and disingenuous, but understood that societal factors may affect individuals in different ways. Therefore, more than anything, expressionist plays attempted to show the world through the eyes of the protagonist. So quite often, what the audience is seeing on stage is a distorted and frequently mechanical world, as the expressionists seem to focus on how people in this newly industrialized society were not being treated as individuals, but rather parts of a societal machine. Hmm. I'm like, okay, that's actually a legitimate response. Yeah. Right? Right. Most it's exp- a clever response. Right? Most expressionist plays don't even give their characters names. Frequently, they are given generic names like young woman, doctor, or clerk. This because fits in with the Because they're just pers- cogs in the machine. Because they're just pieces of the machine. That's right. 
Now, while there were several ef- excellent examples of this throughout Europe, the style began to influence American playwrights as well. And this is where we get plays like Sophie Treadwell's Machinal. Do you know Machinal? I do. Oh, I love Machinal. I'm going to go through it it's here. It's so it's, good. It's so good. Now, for those of you listening who haven't heard of it, just going to give you kind of an overview. Treadwell and if is you an American- haven't read it, you absolutely need to read it. Oh, you absolutely need to. You absolutely yes. need to. Now, Treadwell was an American journalist, and while it wasn't entirely unheard of at the time for a woman to be a playwright, the greatness of her work might not have been recognized until long after her death. Machinal opens to the perspective of young woman who works in a fast-paced office setting with other workers named things like stenographer or adding clerk. Each of these characters has lines of dialogue that speak only to their specific function, and soon young woman catches the eye of Jones, the big boss, at least in this office. He soon makes his desires for the young woman known, but she's not sure. Eventually, she feels pressured into marrying him, as basically it could be expected as part of her societal function. Young woman goes through several pitfalls, including a brief extramarital romance, as she can't stand the abusive man she married. She eventually ends up killing her husband and is sentenced to death. Though she pleads for forgiveness as the life she was living was unbearable, she is ultimately sentenced to execution. Just part of the system. Treadwell bases play on a story she covered in which a woman was executed in the electric chair in 1928. Oh, really? Yep. Like, I kind of wanted to include that in here, but I was like... Oh, no, <laughs> that that story I can't be too sympathetic about. <laughs> yeah. Well, the woman in it, Ruth Snyder, was like the first woman to be um, electrocuted in Sing Sing in the 20th century. And, oh, seriously? Uh, uh-huh. And she ended up uh, killing her husband and made several attempts to do it. And she and her boyfriend finally made it happen. But they both turned on each other. Oh, interesting. So the only thing that I could read uh, about Ruth Snyder that was like her main malfunction was that her husband had had a fiance like 10 years earlier, but she died in an accident and he couldn't stop talking about her. Yeah. Oh, right. So here she's going, yeah, but what is my value to you then? And I'm like, yeah, "Uh, okay. Maybe I don't know the whole story. I just Wikipedia it. I like, I like the play better. Yeah, I'll take the play. Cause, but, but I really, also, I, it's so interesting that, like, uh, we have a female author who's writing. And, you know, the style of all of this is that everyone is just nameless, faceless, part of this machine. Mm-hmm. And yet the person who has a name, even though it is generic, is the male figure. Which right. Which is so also right. telling of that time is that, I mean, really, women were nameless, faceless. Oh, yeah. And you didn't are, matter. You are, again... A function of this society that is beneath men. Just to remind you, yep. you don't have a name. You have a function, and that is to produce children. And we'll let you do some jobs here and there. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Good show. Good show. Whenever this world resumes and Machinal is playing at a theater near you, go see it. Um, Save me a ticket. There you go. <laughs> So expressionism seems to have had its reach well beyond the beginning of the century. And here's a little tidbit. This is fun. Without expressionism, we wouldn't have the concept of the black box theater. Really? Yep. Because they wanted to have a space that could be malleable and still allow an audience, but it didn't have to be the audience sits on one side and the players sit on another. They yeah. said that they can be closer together, but we'll still have a division of of yeah. us and them. So yeah, that's that's where it came Yay, from. Yay, expressionism. We love Yay. Black Box theater. Mm-hmm. But expressionism just couldn't create enough staying power to become completely mainstream. However, expressionism did inspire several other isms that came and went, but ultimately inspired even further evolution into this into the format of theater. So at this point in theater history, how are you feeling? Um <laughs> <laughs> We've we've come a very long way. A long way. Yep. We got just a couple little weird little road bumps to get over and then we're all set. So what could be so traumatic to all these people that felt the need to have their emotions displayed on stage? Well, the First World War was a massive impetus for artistic movements to develop. 
the inventions of new methods of war, the body count of eight and a half million dead, and the oh, resultant man. economic collapse of many Western nations caused many artists to reevaluate the world as best they could. So often, this would be through new movements, and most of which could be considered extreme offshoots of expressionism. <laughs> I feel like we're going into extremism, maybe? Yeah, now we're getting back to the weird. <laughs> One such was futurism. Ooh. Whoa. Whereas most artists would look to the past as inspiration to change the present, the futurists decreed that the past is reprehensible and should not be revered in the slightest. Rather, the futurists demanded that society focus on the present and forward. In forward ho! Forward ho! Yeah, but we wrote this thing last week. Nonsense! <laughs> Nonsense! In the future! <laughs> Write it tomorrow! In his manifesto detailing the movement, Italian multidisciplinarian artist Filippo Marinetti declared the following. I can't do this. Like, I can't do this in a nice voice. <laughs> we want to fight ferociously against the fanatical, unconscious, and snobbish religion of the past, which is nourished by the evil influence of museums. We rebel against the supine admiration of old canvases, old statues, and old objects, and against the enthusiasm for all that is worm-eaten, dirty, and corroded by time. We believe that the common contempt for everything young, new, and palpitating with life is unjust and criminal, end quote. Wow. <laughs> I mean, worm-eating. Worm there, <laughs> that was uh, that was a passionate speech right there. A little bit, a little bit, and it was all in in print. So you know, like the first draft of that, like it wrote through the first couple pages because he was just pressing down. So oh yeah, just driving his pen. Ah, He's like, stupid future. He did. <laughs> the futurists basically deified war as its necessity was in its invention. If so much new stuff could be made, what does it matter if it's for war or not? Mm. And to go along with this notion, the futurists believed that theater audiences should be shocked out of their stupor in a performance, and were some of the first theater artists to suggest removing the division between the performers and the audience, a concept that would come up in another art form, which I'll briefly discuss later. <laughs> So is this, is this breaking of the fourth wall or is this something different? Oh yeah, yeah, that's what they were kind of suggesting. Okay. Uh, I don't okay. think they actually did it because as far as the structure of futurist plays, there's not much to go on because of their insistence on synthetic theater. Generally, futurist plays were short and relatively nonsensical. Marinetti wrote a play called They're Coming, which consisted of actors playing servants rearranging furniture in haste. Thrilling stuff. That's that's the play. <laughs> <laughs> From the scree that we just read. Of, ah, ah, ah! Oh, man, I want to go see some of this stuff. It's going to be revolutionary. And just a bunch of maids and butlers running around and, you know, making sure everything is tidy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, also, it was to suggest even further that people are just kind of cogs in a machine and their movements yeah. are entirely mechanical. But good Lord. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're um, driving the point home quite a bit there. Yeah, right, right. I, mean, um, <laughs> I suppose it should also be said that the futurist fascination with invention and technology could have come from the fact that Italy was the least technologically developed country in Western Europe at the time. So, you it know, they seem... just want to make pasta. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> They're all about like, that pasta. Well, we would like to have some more of the technologies. I'm not happy about that. Oh, <laughs> and also they fully supported the fascist party due to an extreme sense of nationalism. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Another <laughs> of the important isms that resulted from World War I came to be known as Dadaism. Have you studied Dadaism no, at all? I have studied Dadaism, but it's been a long time. It's so weird. I love it. Unlike the futurists, the Dadaists were, uh, were pacifists and more or less reasoned this. If society is supposed to be based upon logic and producing logical outcomes for the majority of people, then how did it lead to war? So if logic can lead to war, then perhaps the expulsion of logic should be the way to live and continue the pursuit of beauty and truth in the arts. Of course. Right. Get rid of logic. 
Yeah. No one can exactly pinpoint how the movement came to be known as Dadaism, but some say that it was completely chosen at random, which fits perfectly with the core of Dadaism, the aleatory, or the happenstance of random chance. The primary figurehead of Dadaism was French artist Tristan Zara, whose favorite mode of writing Dadaist poetry would be to cut up a newspaper article into individual words, put the words into a hat, and then pull them out at random. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I would do that and it would just, like, it wouldn't make anything coherent. And how did this that, ever become a movement? <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly it. It was just completely random. And at the end of it, you went, ah, yeah. yeah. I revealed a lot of truth about randomness. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, um, uh, clock tower, pizza, fish, snaps. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, they're definitely the type that snap. <laughs> as far as theater is concerned, there isn't a lot of published work to come by, but some performances were at least noted and reviewed. One particular Dadaist performance organized by Tristan Zara was performed at the Cabaret Voltaire in Paris in 1916. The performance was a mixture of clowns and circus performers, discordant music and lights. All the while, Zara sang a song and handed out little balls of crunched up paper to audience members. All right. <laughs> what, so like, what was the song and like, what were the crunched up balls? Were there like words yeah. on the paper? Nope, nope, look at all this stuff. And at the end of the night, brain, go away and make something of it. My brain so badly wants to like, <laughs> make sense of this <laughs> but and I no, know that that's no, not the purpose that's of not it. the point <laughs> that's logic and that could lead to war Ashley <laughs> logic can lead to war don't do it don't do don't it out <laughs> fine I wear my underpants on my head and where's the <laughs> peanut butter <laughs> <laughs> we gotta do something with it. I'm not sure what yet now, Dadaism did get some international acclaim, but died a quiet death in Paris, only to be reborn in the 1960s in the host of anti-war art that came about at the time. So things like happenings and uh. had kind of their roots in Dadaism because it was just random chance and reaction. Now, when Dadaism went over like a lead balloon in Paris, <laughs> the movement eventually morphed into something else entirely. There was another French playwright, Guillaume Apollinaire. He sought to create works that move beyond realism, and some historians credit him with coining the term surrealism. <gasps> yes. Oh, God. <laughs> One of my favorite moments in theater. We're going to wrap this thing up with, oh, God, I'm so excited. Now, to Apollinaire, the term meant hyperrealism, meaning that it should have elements of realism, but also include elements of internal, personal strife manifested on stage. Frankly, this type of theater should be dreamlike and mystical as it could better display what was going on for the working class at the time. If psychological and emotional woes and trauma could be exhibited on stage, then perhaps solutions could be found for them. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> now, where do you think this is going to go, Ashley? I don't know, but I'm excited. <laughs> I remember reading this play the first time and I got to the end I immediately went back to the beginning again and went, what the hell did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> Apollinaire culminated his theories into the play, The Breasts of Tiresias. <laughs> Set in Africa, the play tells the story of a woman named Therese, who grows tired of the constraints put upon her as a woman, so she simply chooses to become a man. You go, girl. That's right. Now, in reality, and depending on the level to which the person wishes to do this today, this could simply be, you know, changing of dress and using new pronouns, or this could involve extensive surgery and hormone therapy. But since none of those ideas existed at the time, and this was supposed to be somewhat dreamlike, Therese simply wills it to be. Hmm. Here are the actual stage directions in the play. She gives a great cry and opens her blouse. Her breasts pop out. One blue the other red, and as she lets them go, they fly up, balloons on the ends of strings. I mean, that's kind of beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Super she... weird, but I kind of love it. <laughs> she offers some poetic reflection on her soon to be gone memories, commenting on how attractive they are and the stage directions continue. 
She pulls the strings and makes the balloons bob about. <laughs> they are so lovely. I love my breasts. <laughs> she then speaks in more verse about how being virtuous is generally better than vice. So she should probably stop playing with her breasts now and get rid of them. She then lights a cigarette lighter and makes both of the breasts explode. <gasps> Oh, girl, you should just let him fly away. Soon after, a beard and mustache instantaneously appear on her face. (laughs) She takes the name of Tiresias, like the soothsayer of Greek legend, and begins to live as a man, eventually becoming a general and a member of parliament. Wow. Meanwhile, her estranged husband (laughs) has willed himself into being able to give birth. And in the time they are apart... He has given birth to 40,000 children in one afternoon. Wow, that's a lot. (laughs) But think about that. Like I said, they're trying to be dreamlike. If I just woke up and said, I had the weirdest dream. I dreamt (laughs) I was a woman and I didn't want to be a woman anymore. So then all of a sudden I was a man and my boobs became balloons and I I played with them for a bit and I popped them and then I, I, I got a beard and mustache. And I went away and became a really powerful man. And then my, my husband, who then decided to become a woman, had 40,000 babies one day. In one afternoon. That's a dream. Like, I get that. <laughs> yeah. like, that's a really weird dream. What did you eat before going to bed? Yeah. <laughs> the Breasts of Tiresias was written in 1903, but it was not performed until 1917. But in its wake, the surrealist movement was born. An artistic perspective that focused on the dreamlike and the nearly impossible. One famous surrealist was Antonin Artaud, who is credited with the movement known as the Theater of Cruelty. (gasps) Uh, One of my favorites, and we're not going to get into it too much here. (laughs) We'll save it for another day. Oh my God. He broke from the surrealist late in the 1920s and launched his own manifesto, which more or less could be seen as a culmination of all of the isms. I won't go into it too much here because I'm thinking Arto definitely needs to have his own episode of Euripides Humanities. He's just got so much to talk about. Oh, I can't wait to talk about a spurt of blood. But <laughs> so all in all, the anti-realist movements did inspire further movements in theater's history in theater history's future. And it is fun to pick apart how these movements did affect theater as we know it today. And as I've said on this program before, theater seems to be a beast that is ever evolving from generation to generation, which means it's still evolving. But nonetheless, unfortunate as the eventual fates of the anti-realist movements were, there can be no doubt that if art is reflective of life, then there must have been some massive collective psychological expurgation that needed to happen at the beginning of the 20th century and beyond. And that is the story for today. Yay! (laughs) I have wanted to deep dive into the anti-realist movement for a long time. Oh, man. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks the other day when you're like, hey, yeah, I'll record a podcast. Ah, That (laughs) is such a roller coaster. And like, it's so amazing because you see like where theater has built from there because theater is always changing. But you Mm -hmm. can see how even the things that weren't a success have laid the groundwork for where we are and movements that came afterwards. Right. It's just, it's right. so cool to look back in history and see that. And also that right. guy that was like, I can write better than Shakespeare. <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think he's really <laughs> celebrated all that much, but I, I mean, I, as I was researching and doing some more work, there are so there, like he inspired almost cult movements. There are people oh, who will perform his stuff in like total punk rock gear. And one article I read was like, Alfred Jarry than the punk rock play of the 1890s. And I'm like, well, in a way, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, I I often refer to this, I've said it on this program a couple of times that, you know, you can look at theater history and just history in general. It's like a pendulum, you know, we'll go one way for a long while and then it'll start swinging back the other way. But sometimes it goes really fast back over to the other way. And sometimes it goes really fast back the other way. And in this one, it was like, it got sick from how much motion it was going through. (laughs) 
Yeah. Well, and it's so telling of the times because, I mean, the Industrial Revolution was such a tumultuous discovery. Like, oh, so man. much was happening. Yeah. But, of course, theater was going to be reflective of everything that was happening in the world, especially oh, yeah. you have the Industrial Revolution and then going into the Depression, World War One, And it's <laughs> just, it's so crazy. There's so much happening in such a short amount of time. I, you know, when I look back at it, the methods of being able to communicate start to become a little bit more speedy. You know, I mean, it's not, we're, we're attaching a note to a carrier pigeon and hoping it gets to where it's going to (laughs) go to, I can go to an office downtown. There's a man with a little button and he presses it a whole bunch of times. And somewhere on the other end of the country, a message pops out based on that, the telegraph. Yeah. And just the revolution of that, being able to go that far, you can almost see how like history speeds up with that. Like these movements go back and forth as fast as they can. I mean, well, uh, frankly, look at what has gone on the last four years with freedom of speech in social media. (laughs) You know, with people being able to spout this and spout that and spout this and spout that, like, it's wild how much ideas can be well, exchanged now. The acceleration of the cell phone, because, you know, Ooh. when you and I first met, <laughs> not everyone, like people had cell phones, but it yeah. wasn't, there definitely weren't iPhones. You yeah. know, they were still flip phones or like the little sliders. So you could mm-hmm. text, but you were still getting charged per text. Yep. And now it's like you have a computer in your pocket Yep. And even with our current circumstances, with everything that's happened with COVID-19, Oof. the the art that has come out, even in isolation, has been so fascinating to watch. Right, right. Because right. we're in a great global strife right now, and yep. communication is, like, the internet is our way to communicate, and everything that has come through on the internet is just amazing to watch. right. Uh, on the last episode, we talked a little bit about the, the renaissance that follows the plague, because a renaissance okay. always follows a plague. We've done our best in these last several months to just keep ourselves entertained and keep our, our spirits up. And I actually read this the other day that, <clears throat> you know, at the beginning of this whole thing, people were like, well, you know, we're probably going to have another baby boom after this. All the people are going to be together and not have much more to, to occupy themselves with. They're actually looking at it now and there's like, no, there's going to be a COVID baby bust. <laughs> like even being in close quarters together, people are like, I don't even want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is going to come out of this? And that's a yeah. fascinating thing to, to think about. Like, you had the Industrial Revolution and it inspired realism. Well, realism got too real. So now we got to go anti-real. And anti-realism went way anti-real. And now who knows where we'll be? It's unfortunate that it had to happen, but it's going to be fascinating to watch. Yeah, so. five years down the road from now, looking back at the this moment in our history, it will be so interesting to see the art that comes about and our response to this global pandemic and to this global suffering. Right. Because some of the best art comes from Ooh. that understanding of suffering. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Woo. That's yeah. fascinating. Oh, well, there we go. Fascinating little trip down anti-realism lane. Yeah. <laughs> I really like your uh, reaction to the breasts flying out. <laughs> I, I locate, like I would go see that play. I mean, even though the 40,000 children scares the hell out of me, like that, that's too much. That's no longer a dream. That's a nightmare, but I love everything else about it. <laughs> right. Right. I it's, go see it's it. It's fascinating. I mean, read, that's one of those plays. It's like, it proves that theater needs to be seen. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ashley, thanks for joining me on this episode. Yes, of thank you so much. That was so fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope we get to get you back on here again sometime. Uh, but for all my listeners, uh, this has been another episode of Euripides Humanities. I am Aaron Odom, your host, and I will see you at intermission.
Hey friends, this is your host, Aaron Odom, coming at you again. I want to thank you for listening to today's episode. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us a review wherever you pick this podcast up. Or go ahead and like, share, subscribe, all the cool stuff you do with podcasts. We are Trident Theater. That's T-H-E-A-T-R-E. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our website, www.tridenttheater.com. Once again, this is Aaron Odom. And we try to get a new episode out every two weeks. So hope to see you again in a fortnight.